Okay, so um, welcome to one of the cheery subjects for the evening. <laughs> I've got a few notes because my husband will tell you that when I get on this topic, he has trouble getting me to shut up. Oh, thank you for the messenger comment, Karen. <laughs> um, right, okay, so we're talking tonight about photographing the dead but I think perhaps to start with I should tell you guys a little bit about me and why I developed I don't want to say a passion for this subject but um, why I became very very interested in it and ended up in the situation where I can talk for hours about it so how did I come to photography? Because I'm a photographic artist and obviously this talk is about photography. Um, basically, I learned photography as a child. I learned from my dad, like a lot of people of my age did. This is back in the days when dads had the camera. And I always had a little bit of an obsession about it. So when we got to the point my father had passed away and my mum was unfortunately diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer and I was essentially her primary support, emotional support. Towards the end of her life I became her physical carer as well and I needed to find, for me, a coping mechanism that was going to allow me to cope so that I could support her because I'm a great believer in a situation like that you have to prioritize things and I turned to photography and I picked up my camera and something inside me made the shift from photography as documenting the world around me into creating images that had a concept behind them and what I didn't realize at the time was I was moving into the realm of um, contemporary or conceptual photography I didn't know that I was just following my intuition and doing what felt right to me as a release for all the emotions etc that I needed to keep inside and that led to uh, one of my big projects. Uh, it was probably the project I'm best known for to date, at least I hope to date, because we always hope our future projects will do so well. And that's the Ghost Project. And I'll just quickly show you a couple of images so you can see the sort of aesthetic that I was producing. Um, I'm streaming this on my laptop and I've got my Mac here so I can try and show you some photos. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see them. So these are a couple from, oh that's a small one, I don't want that, we need a bigger one, don't we? Um, from the Ghost Project, it was very black and white. I suppose some people would say, um, there was a lot of Gothic Victorian imagery coming through into that. And what that did was that led me to a point where I became very very interested in the relationship between photography and death and this is something that loads of books have been written about and you know one of the famous ones that goes on everybody talks about is Camera Lucida but they're often talking about the idea of the photograph as capturing something and it's a metaphorical death and all that sort of thing and everything but I became really interested in how people had and might use photography as part of the grieving process and part of the coping mechanisms because that's what I was doing. That's what that's what I was doing. And I was wondering, you know, a lot of people thought, well, there was some very non-complimentary comments made to me <laughs> by various people. Um, and it, 
it was something that I wanted to learn more about as a topic. So I started looking into it and that was how I came across post-mortem photography, which is defined as photographing someone who is deceased. Okay. And tonight I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about that, a bit about why I find it such a fascinating genre of photography, why I think it's very misunderstood and misrepresented in 21st century society and some of the symbology around it and its history, how it developed, all that sort of thing. Um, so if that's not your cup of tea, probably click off now. Um, so there, there we go with that. Um, so pre-Victorian times, Pre-Victorian times, there was a very rich set of traditions around how people dealt with the dead and dying, etc. Uh, this is a death mask. Death masks have been around for thousands of years. Think Tutankhamun, etc. This one is actually of Oliver Cromwell. And the earliest... Uh, known case from Britain is 5th century. So there is a long tradition of them in this country. And there was very laid out ways of having a funeral, what was appropriate, what wasn't, etc. And postmortem photography slid into that. So for example, death, death masks became much less common as post-mortem photography grew and they very much it very much took the place of the death masks in some cases. Um, I haven't seen the book Wisconsin Death Trip, Andrew, but is that not a film that you sent me a link to a while back? I'm sure... Oh, I, I don't know. If not, I'll have to look it up. Um, I'm going to concentrate tonight when I'm talking primarily about Britain and British traditions. They are different in different countries. For example, the Far East has pretty much no tradition of postmodern photography. America does have, North America does have a tradition of it, but it does vary in some ways to the European tradition. Uh, there's not quite such a tradition in South America, although there is some tradition. Um, and again, the traditions in other parts of Europe vary slightly. So I'm pretty much concentrating on Britain and Ireland. I'm also not going to talk about war photography or police photography. <laughs> Let's bring back the death mask, says Wendy. Uh, yeah, some of them are. Some of them really are quite beautiful actually. In fact, Andrew was talking about one uh, earlier in his talk. So if you didn't see Andrew's talk earlier, I think you can still view them on Facebook. So it might be worth going back because he was talking about one from uh, Paris, I believe, in the 1800s. Um, right, so we've got this very rich tradition of how to deal with the dead and how people view death and dying. Um, I'm just checking my notes here because otherwise I, I will wander off on this topic and Lord only knows where we'll, we'll end up with. What we really need to do is, personally, I think we need to look at these practices. We can look at them through our 21st century eyes, but we also need to look at them through the viewpoints of the people at the time. So one of the things that you'll see, if, if you type into Google or whatever, post-mortem photography, you will come up with loads of articles and they're all sensationalised clickbait. Um, you know, you won't believe these creepy Victorian post-mortem photographs, um, stuff like that. And it really is just a way of getting people to click onto them and do the factor and I think that is 
I think that really is missing the point that it's a very rich tradition and it was a very important tradition and still is to certain portions of society, basically the people it affects. So I think we need to consider the background that they're against. And it's also important to note, I'll say it at this point as opposed to at the end, postmortem photography still exists in modern British society, but it has become much more confined and much more limited. And at the moment, apart from a very, very few people, it is confined to basically stillborn babies or babies who die very, very young. And there are charities. One, uh, for example, is Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. And photographers will donate their time, go and take photographs for the family. And that's very much seen as something that can be very therapeutic and part of the healing process for them to have that uh, visual reference of the child that they've lost. Um, so it is still around, but it has evolved. Right, I'm going to keep going with my notes, otherwise I'll start talking all about that again. Um, so pre-Victorian times, so talking back in the Georgian times, the emphasis when somebody died was on keeping their body safe. Now that might sound a bit weird to us, you know, they're dead. But at the time, there was a huge belief in physical resurrection at the Day of Judgment. So the prevailing belief was that the Day of Judgment comes, you are physically, your body is physically resurrected. And that led to a problem because at the same time, you had the rise of medicine, medical schools, anatomists. So basically, body snatchers and the resurrection men. If you have a medical school and you're trying to teach people about uh, the human body, etc., one of the best ways to do that is to dissect a human body. Now, at the time, the only legal way to get hold of a body was from the gallows, basically somebody who'd been executed. If you'd been hung because you know you committed a crime, etc., your body would usually end up at one of the medical schools being uh, used as teaching aid. They weren't only used as teaching aids, uh, you could also, members of the public could, you know, buy a ticket to go in and watch the dissection. But there wasn't enough supply. That led to the body snatchers or the resurrection men as they were sometimes called, most famously Burke and Hare up in uh, Edinburgh. And that was basically to fill the need, the demand for dead bodies. Uh, we all know certain resurrection men went, um, took it a step further, but that's a whole different talk. As a result of that, there was huge anxiety around what happened to the body after death. And that led to double and triple coffins, mort safes. If you go to an old cemetery, you'll often find um, a, a grave has got massive railings over it and stuff like that and that was that was all to try and keep the body safe ready for the resurrection because of the physical resurrection now eventually anxiety around that particularly in the upper classes uh because it what body snatching wasn't just uh confined to working classes and the lower classes you know people of high status had uh, had their bodies taken as well Eventually, that led to so much anxiety within the people who make the laws <laughs> that they brought out a new law. And that was the Anatomy Act. And it was in 1832. And what that said was, if you are too poor to be able to pay for a funeral, your body can go to the anatomists. So basically, if you can't pay for a funeral, you're going to end up being dissected and they called it dying on the parish not being able to afford a funeral now obviously nobody really wanted that I mean let's be honest you're not going to are you 
That was also compounded by the fact that in a lot of the big cities, the churchyards were getting absolutely stuffed full of burials. And especially London and uh, Glasgow, etc., they, they needed a resolution to this. So in 1836, yes, 1836, I've got it in my notes, there was an act of parliament which allowed for the creation of large cemeteries. And this then started a shift away from burying people in the local parish to burying them in designated places, for example, the Magnificent Seven in London, think Highgate, the Glasgow Necropolis. And these places were specifically designed to give a feeling of safety to the families that the bodies of their loved ones would be safe and they wouldn't end up um, in a medical school. So they would have big walls at the side, uh, Glasgow's even had a moat and that was all based around that. At the same time you had photography starting to be developed so although photography is often said to have been invented in 1839 by Henry Fox Talbot there were some um, processes starting to filter through before that his is the one that gave birth to what we now consider modern photography. There were other things before that. So it, it was it was in the um, in the air, so to speak, in the 1830s. And of course, that was when we moved over into the Victorian age as well. With Victoria, I believe it was uh, 1837, she, she um, became queen. So as this is all happening, the emphasis moves from being safe in death to having a good death. This was an old idea, it was originally um, a Catholic idea from before the Reformation. It was then taken on by the Protestants, uh, it fell out of disuse a little bit, but the evangelists really brought it back to the fore in the 1800s. And this idea of a good death. And that, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that combined with the Victorian ideas of, you know, rigid society and uh, being seen to do the right thing and all this, that and the other. And that led to a complete shift. And that was what led to the growth of postmodern photography. Um, right. So actually, let's talk about a good death now. So what was the idea of a good death? It was the idea of putting your affairs in order, it was doing right by your family and accepting God's will. That was how it started. That then evolved and it became entwined with all the rituals around death that the Victorians uh, adhered to and felt were very important. There was a lot of uh, religious pressure to do right by the dead, basically. Um, there was also societal pressure, you know, to be seen to be doing the right thing, etc. Um, that very much fed into the demand for post-mortem photography. So, for example, it was quite common for people to die suddenly. If they did, and you lived quite away from where they were, you possibly might not even hear about it until after the funeral. So one example would be that you would be given a, uh, a post-mortem photograph almost as a substitute. And that would then be acceptable as part of the grieving process for you and all that sort of stuff. There was also the aspect of, in a lot of cases, there were little or no um, likenesses of people so you know we all know how important if you lose someone to be able to see their photograph is you know if we go back in time these these people may not have had any likenesses especially if you're talking a child so there we go um 
So this all combined along with the very symbology, um, for example, uh, the flower um, language of flowers that the Victorians were obsessed with. Talk a bit more about that later. And you started to get uh, formats of postmortem photography. Uh, what was acceptable, what wasn't, what should be included, what shouldn't be, that sort of thing. And they fall into two general types. Death is sleep and uh, dead is alive. And we'll, we'll talk about the two different types. Right, let me pull up. Uh, here we go. Can you guys see that okay? I wasn't sure if I'd be able to share um, photos with you directly. Apparently you can. I tried it, but it wouldn't let me. Um, so this is my uh, solution. So what we have here, this is Lord Cavendish. Now, he was um, killed by Irish extremists. I'm putting that in inverted commas because I am very well aware that one man's terrorist is often another man's freedom fighter. And I, I don't want to put anything on the, the, the politics in what we're talking about here. Um, so he was killed. He'd been sent to Ireland to take over, basically running the place as the chief, se chief secretary of Ireland by his wife's uncle, who was Prime Minister Gladstone. So, you know, very high up person here. He hadn't been there very long. I thought, oh, go and have a drink. Oh, hadn't been there very long. He was attacked. He was murdered. And it sent absolute shock waves through not only Britain and Ireland because somebody, you know, had been murdered in this way, etc. It, it, was, it was this whole Irish problem. Um, Katie's asking if I could share the photos on faith, on a Facebook thread afterwards. Yes, I can. That is not a problem. And Lord Spencer, so presumably one of Diana's ancestors, as a surprise for his widow, arranged for a postmortem photograph, which is this to be done. And I think that in itself tells us so much about how differently we view this sort of thing today to how they did back then. Because, I mean, can you imagine somebody today, they get murdered and one of their friends says, oh, let's get a picture done of them dead to show, you know, as a surprise for their widow. It wouldn't happen. But that's modern 21st century way of viewing things. Back then, it was considered something that would help her grieve. It was considered a good, good thing to do for her, for the gesture and everything. I suspect there was politics involved as well because this photo was actually used in, in the political climate. I'll talk a little bit about that later in a minute. The photo itself, it shows uh, Lord Cavendish lying underneath the sheet, head on a plush pillow, as if he's asleep in bed. It's as if he's tucked up in bed, somebody's crept in and covered him with a load of plant foliage. So what you have there is um, you have ferns, etc. There's some roses, all, you know, quite artfully placed around the body. That is very common of photographs of adults in Britain that are post-mortem photographs. So it's very common to, them to be shown as if basically they're asleep. The plants are often put around them, the flowers, uh, there's the symbology of the uh, flower language coming in there and they may also have served, in fact I suspect they did serve a very practical purpose and that was uh, uh, order control. Can't really put that delicately, can you? Um, there was no refrigeration, there was no embalming at the time, so these photos had to be done quite quickly for obvious reasons, etc. I'll talk a little bit about more about that later. 
Um, so this particular photo was used politically and it was even displayed just down the road from the home of Art de Mort in Scarborough in the train station. But there we go. You also get children and infants photographed in uh, death of sleep photos. There's, I've got one of those as well. Oh, that's tiny. Teeny, 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 far too teeny. Can you see that? You're not going to see that very well. It's the picture that we used in the little poster for this. And what it shows is a child, maybe about three or four, reclining on a sofa. But unlike an adult, she is dressed in a pretty dress. She has socks and shoes on. So although it looks like she's asleep, it looks like she's she's not in bed asleep. It looks like she's just laid down for a nap. And that was very common with uh, children and infants. Adults, it was much more common. They would be, uh, the body would be cleaned. They would be dressed. The orifices would be stuffed with rags or cotton wool to uh, prevent leakage. Sorry if anybody's sensitive. The waist and the thighs would be bound. Socks would be put on the feet and then the feet would be bound together and you'd be laid out. Um, interesting note, there seems in the articles published at the time, there seems to have been a little bit of an obsession in how the nostrils appear on the photograph. No idea why, haven't been able to figure out why, but there seems to have been an obsession with it. Um, children were also shown in other ways, but adults, pretty much that was the format, death and sleep. Um, with children, you didn't tend to get flowers being placed over the body in the way that you did. Let's see if I can pull up Freddy boy again. Can I pull that up a bit more? I don't know if you can see that. The flowers, you only really tended to get that in postmortem photographs in Britain, at any rate, for adults. Didn't get it in the children. And that was very much to come in with uh, why the photographs were being taken. And the general feeling is that with children, it was being done much more as a happy memory. It was done specifically to evoke happy memories for the family. So there was much more of a pretense, uh, or there was an attempt at making a pretense of the child still being alive in some way or just asleep. Um, Interestingly, in America, they took that to a whole new level, but I'll, I'll mention that later, but I, I don't want to talk about it too much because otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, flowers, the language of flowers. So the Victorians were potty on it, absolutely bonkers on, on this. The idea of um, a flower could carry a hidden meaning and they used it all the time. You know, people sent flowers to each other as messages and things like this. It actually originated in the Ottoman Empire wasn't a Victorian invention, but they took it and they ran with it. And it was very much formalised in 1884 by Kate Greenway in her book, Language of Flowers. And it's still around today. It's not as widely used, but we still associate some of those um, Victorian associations with flowers. So, for example, um, lilies, we associate very much with death, but the Victorians associated it with purity. Um, roses love, you know, Valentine's Day. I mean, come on, you're not going to buy your Valentine. <laughs> you're not going to get her a bunch of lilies, are you? Um, you're going to get her a bunch of roses. Um, specifically, a white rose didn't just mean love. It meant, I am worthy of you. Ferns, which we see here, can't really make out the, the type of fern, but ferns could denote fascination, but they could also um, denote reverence. 
So the Victorians used what plants were available. So obviously they had to use what was available, what was in season, what was growing locally, etc. And combined them in ways to try and convey a message. So one example where this is still in use today with regards to funeral practices is the family cross which is still traditional it's in decline but it is still traditional in Britain and that is traditionally a great big cross you know goes on top of the coffin it is usually made up of white chrysanthemums and often roses okay so you'd have roses at the, the bit where the arms cross and the rest would be white croissants there's a practical reason for that croissants are actually quite cheap to cover a large area but croissants Although they're not mentioned by Kate Greenway, they are often used as denoting truth. So you have croissants, you have the roses, etc. And basically it's, it was done in such a way to give the message that the, the departed was pure and to commend them to God. They are worthy of God. And the family is declaring this as a truth. So it's effectively the family commending their departed loved one to God, the Christian God, through flowers. Which I actually think is kind of cool. Um, flowers were very much not used as part of portraits for the living. They were, however, often used in borders to go around the photographs. Um, but they were absolutely adored by a lot of artists, such as the Pre-Raphaelites, etc., who again built in the language of flowers into a lot of their artwork and stuff. Um, the other form of photograph, let's see if I can get some up for you. Uh, uh, actually, I'll just show you this, this one quickly. Um, again, I'll see if I can get it up big. Don't know if you can see it. I'll put it on the Facebook thing. This is a, a later postmortem uh, photograph. This is of a lower status person than Lord Frederick uh, Cavendish. And in this case, apart from the inclusion of a coffin, it's very, very similar. So you've got the body laid out, it's laid out, it's got, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Sheet, that's it, it's got a sheet, there's flowers around, but in this case, there's similar flowers, you've got croissants, you've got roses, you've got ferns, so the imagery is the same there, but in this case, you've got a coffin included, and it is speculated that in a lot of cases with lower class families, that has actually been done specifically to show that they could afford a coffin and they hadn't, the person hadn't died on the parish. So although this photo is around about 1900, that's still harking back to that fear from the early 1800s and earlier of the body snatchers, etc. So I think it's interesting how that's continued on. So it's probably been included to show that the family was wealthy enough to have one. Um, if we move on to some, where are we? Okay, I'll try and make this one big as well. This isn't, can you see that one? No, I'm going to try and make it a bit bigger. Try and zoom in a bit more. Can I, can I? Okay, I hope you can see that. What we've got here, this is the little girl who unfortunately has passed away and she's positioned in a chair, sat in a chair and positioned around her are her dolls. I'm just going to have to pause a moment because there's a cat yowling at the door. That's my cat and if I don't let him in, he will pot him. So we may have female, feline accompaniment. Are you coming in? Come on then. Don't knock anything over, please. Okay, if you see a black and white cat, it's Salem. 
I think he's about to jump up. Here he comes. Do you want to say hi? Come here. Here you go. Go on, get on the tail. There you go. Don't show your bum to the people. Oh, no shame. I've now got cat fur all over my face. Right. Okay, down you get. Come on, hush. <laughs> you can tell it's live, can't you? Uh, <laughs> cat fur. Okay, so with this young lady. Death. <laughs> obviously, she's unfortunately passed away. She looks about five ish. I'm not good with small children's ages. She's got her dolls positioned around her. This one here has been positioned as if she has it in the crook of her arm. He's now yelling to go out. Are you going out now? Go on then. And her head has been positioned as if she's just fallen asleep cradling her doll. Um, if you were just to casually look at the photo and not realise that her eyes were closed, you might even still think she was alive. And that's quite common to pose a child with their dolls. It was also common with uh, children who were alive, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Why is she positioned like this exactly? Um, bring it down a bit. So you've got her dolls and stuff like this. Why? It's probably practical. In all likelihood, there is a framework behind her that she's been, you know, attached to, tied to, and the dolls are being used to hide what has been used to position her. And we don't see that in Britain with adults. We only see it with children in the dead as alive photos. Also, they tended to use the same sort of format with post-mortem photographs of children and infants as they did with living children and, in, uh, and infants. Got one here. Again, I'll try and blow it up a bit. So this is a living child. Again, she's positioned on a chair sort of chair sofa with a doll straight at the camera Sunday best clothing etc and this is something that's mirrored in a lot of the images that you have of living children and unfortunately passed away children they seem to have used the same formatting the same symbology often with a little girl pretty dress doll in the arm and there's often a little posy of flowers or something or other like that to denote femininity, etc. In America, in North America, specifically America, I'm not sure about Canada, it was much more common for that type of approach to be used with adults as well, for them to be positioned as if they were still alive. And in America, they there was a shift in emphasis. In America, the photographers very much were taking the view that it was their job to portray them as if they were still alive. Whereas in Britain, it was much more a case of creating something for the family um, and it was more the death in sleep. If they were being portrayed as alive, they would usually still have their eyes closed, but be positioned as if they're just, um, you know, with the dolls, that sort of thing. There is actually quite a disturbing article, which was published in America, but the uh, photographic press refused. I've still got cat fur on my face. The photographic press refused to publish it in this country and it was written by an American photographer and it was given advice on how to get the eyes right. And basically what he said was, this is a bit squeamish, if anybody's squeamish, um, cover your ears for 30 seconds. What he said was take, take a teaspoon and push the bottom lids down and then use the, the end of the teaspoon to push the top lids right up and then get your fingers in there and position the eyeball. 
that was relatively common practice in America. It was considered no in Britain. And that's one area where the two traditions uh, diverge. Okay. Um, you also would have, um, this is going slightly into police photographs, but it was quite common in America. I think probably because of the massive distances that if a criminal was caught and convicted and hanged, they would often be photographed in the coffin, up against a wall, upright like that. And the purpose of those photographs were more to prove that they'd been caught and killed. Um, there you go. Uh, whole new topic, that one. Um, infants were frequently shown in cribs or with family members or with their nurses. I've got two photos here. I'm sorry if anyone finds this uh, distressing. Let's just close them down. But, you know, it is a talk on post-mortem photography. This one. I mean, I think I'm going to do a little bit smaller than that. Yeah. This is a, I don't know if you can see it, this is a fairly common one that you will find if you look around on the internet. Some of these are quite difficult to find. Um, the originals are now in the collections of museums and universities etc. There are a lot of fakes online if you just do a Google for post-mortem photography. It's a lot of fakes. Um, so when I was researching this, I, I really did stick to ones that were could be authenticated. This one is a mother and child. So that mother has just lost that baby. So she's cradling the child and she's looking at the child. In this one, let's see if we can get this one up. Again, the child has been lost, but the lady holding the child is looking straight at the camera, and that's because that is the nurse of the child. So typically what you would see is if it's the nurse, they would be looking at the camera. If it's the mother, they're often looking at the child. So again, you've got um, format and symbology coming in. Um, given how distasteful this practice could be, as in physically taking the photos etc, it does lead to the question of how widespread was it, how many photographers did it, how much of their um, their work was made up of post-mortem photographs and the simple answer to that is pretty much nobody nowadays knows. I suspect nobody knew back then because it wasn't something that was tended to be advertised. So if you had a photographer who was who did postmortem photography, often people would find out that that photographer did it by word of mouth. It wasn't advertised. Um, the uh, we haven't got a full record of the ones that survived because of events that happened in the um, early twentieth century. A lot were actually destroyed. There is one photographic studio where the day books, those are basically the records of what they photographed every day, etc., have survived. Postmortem photography for that particular studio made up about 10% of the images that they made, 10% of their commissions. It will have made more than 10% of their income, their revenue. And that leads to the crux of why photographers would agree to do post-mortem photography. It paid well. Um, there are various documented cases from the time where, you know, basically families said, name me price. Um, so that's pretty much why a lot of photographers did it. I suspect most of them didn't do it because they enjoyed it. They did it because it paid well. 
Um, that leads us on to why did it fall out of favour? And that's several things, two main things, plus shifting attitudes that happened because of that. You've got the First World War, masses upon masses of death at the same time. Obviously, the Spanish flu hit, which kind of feels a bit relevant considering what's going on at the moment. And you also, at the same time, started to see a shift in end of care, end of life care. During Victorian times, earlier, etc., basically people died at home. When you died at home, the body was prepared and dressed and laid out, usually by the female members of the family. It was considered a duty of wives, mothers, daughters, sisters to do that. With the growth in popularity of hospitals and improved medicine, meaning people were prepared to go to hospitals, etc. Death moved from the home into a professional setting, into a hospital. So when somebody died, they would then be, the body would be cleaned, etc. in the hospital. Put the two together and you start getting a shift in how people relate to death and how people view death. And that led to a decline in postmodern photography. As I say, it has survived into modern Britain, primarily with, unfortunately, stillborns. There isn't really much of an active postmodern uh, tradition outside of that area in Britain now. There is in other parts of the world, but not in Britain now. Um, I suppose the only other question really is, do I have first-hand experience of postmortem photography? Yes. Am I going to show them? No. <laughs> I'm sure you'll understand why. Um, it, it's a privacy thing. I can attest that it does help or it can help with the grieving process. And as such, I think personally, and that's one reason why I'm giving this talk, it would be a good thing if we could get away from the sensationalizing and uh, labeling as creepy of this type of photography. You're not gonna believe it. I've now got the dog crying at the door. I'm I'm not going to open it because she'll knock everything over. Um, I'll give her a chew after within a big cuddle. Don't worry. So, yeah, I think personally it's something that um, if people had access to this a bit more, and by that I'm going to include, for example, not just... Uh, specific postmortem photographs, but I actually think it would be helpful if there was a small um, amount of photography done at funerals, because most people are shell-shocked at a funeral. And afterwards, those photographs, you know, for example, um, the flowers, that sort of thing. Um, photos of the cards on the flowers, you know, that can actually be very good as a focus for grieving. And I'm going to take a little drink now and I'm going to say uh, thank you very much for joining me and does anyone have any questions? Um, it does seem to be scrolling up now so if you have any questions or anything like that if I can answer them I will. Um, I'm going to have a quick drink because I'm getting a bit parched. Now I'm going to sit here nervously waiting to see if anybody's going to ask any questions or if I've browbeaten you all in submission. <laughs> um, is that a question to me, Katie? It says, Diane Goldby, would you want photos taken? Is that a question to me or a question to Diane? Thank you, Helen. I didn't even know you were there. <laughs> Helen just said, well done. Um, 
Would I want photos taken of me? Um, I'm not bothered. However, if my loved ones would find it useful, snap away. Um, Tina's saying she, it's great to know the tradition's still there, though private. Um, all right, the question was for Diane. Uh, I have uh, funerals, actually, I have photographed too. And I don't know if I'll photograph any more, but those particular ones, I was, um, they were immediate family members, so I felt I could take the decision. Um, because not everyone understands you turning up at a funeral with a camera. But personally, I found those photos very, um, very therapeutic afterwards. Right, I'm just going to try and answer some of these. I'm seeing some things. Um, right, Sandra saying, is postmortem photography still done in America other than stillborns? Not really. Again, like Britain, it's very much fallen out of uh, fashion. There was uh, different influences over there because um, you also had the Civil War, etc. Plus, uh, spirit photography was much more common over there, and that sort of, in some cases, took the role of postmortem uh, photographs. There were a lot of people killed in the Civil War. People didn't get the bodies back, so they would uh, go uh, to a spirit photographer and get a forgery um, of them with the spirit of their lost loved one behind them. They were all fake, by the way. Um, Helen says, I have taken photos of flowers at funeral, but it feels socially unacceptable. I absolutely agree with you, Helen. Um, I, however, think the world would be a better place if it was more acceptable. Um, but you have to consider the nearest and dearest feelings. And I've only done it uh, when I've been one of the nearest and dearest. Therefore, I've got the right to make that decision. But I've also taken the camera in the church with me. Um, Naomi. Oh, hello, Naomi. You made it. Um, Naomi says, I got my husband to take pictures of my dad in his coffin because he looked so peaceful. I've seen a few of children, but not adults. Personally, I always take pictures of the cards and flowers. Yep. I see personally see nothing wrong with that. And it's it is amazing how um, people's attitudes towards it can change. So, for example, when my father passed away, um, that was the first funeral that I photographed and obviously I did some post-mortem photography etc and my mum initially was <gasps> shock horror horrified and everything but I'll tell you what she treasured those photos afterwards you would not have been able to prize them out of her fingers she was absolutely um, her feeling was uh, very much changed by going through the experience of having those photographs that she could then look at down the line months later when she was ready um wendy said i'm interested if you have any book recommendations for learning more about the flower symbolism uh kate greenway uh was published in 1884 i think it is it's called language of flowers if you look online you will find scanned pdf versions of it you can occasionally pick up uh, second-hand versions, etc. I'm not sure if it's still in print, but it is definitely still kicking around. That was very much the one that codified it in Victorian times, and all of the rest basically stem from that point. So that would be the one that I would suggest that you look at. Um, I'm hoping I haven't missed anybody's questions. Uh, Helen says, I agree with photos at funerals. It's just another ceremony at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, 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 I missed anybody's comments or questions. Um, Wendy's asking all websites. Was that for the, um, I'm going to assume that was for the language of flowers. There is a, when I was researching this, I actually researched this topic and wrote my dissertation for my masters on this, which I dug out earlier. There is, um, I looked at modern sources as, as well as um, older sources. 
at the time and when I accessed it, it was 2015 so it might have changed there was a Victoriana style nursery based down in Kent and they had a lot of information on their website and it was called uh, Victorian Bazaar B A Z A A R dot com if it's still there have a look um, because some of the meanings have morphed a little bit over time um, oh Catherine I'm glad you found it interesting hello David I didn't know you were there um, glad you enjoyed it has anyone else got any other specific questions I'm happy to sit here and chat away but um, obviously <laughs> I can talk about this subject all night if it comes up um, when we're out you know when you meet people and stuff like that you can you can almost see my husband rolling his eyes oh god here we go she's on the post-mortem photography and um, he has banned me from discussing it at meals I have done that in the past yeah so Are there any books on this topic that you'd recommend? No. Um, there are very, very few books on it. There is a lady called, I'm going to check this, I'm pretty sure it's Audrey Linkman. Um, I believe she's Australian from the top, from memory. And she is one of the world's. Um, uh, authorities on this I'm just looking to see where it is in my references she has written a book but it's an academic book it's not a popular um, a book aimed at uh, popular um, death and photography and that is published by Raytheon books and I believe it's Audrey Linkman um, She's also had various uh, articles published on it in various journals and stuff like that. There are quite a lot of um, good books, but again, they're academic, um, around funerary practices and stuff like that. But there is very little that's actually been published to do with postmortem photography. Uh, Wendy's saying thanks for the info, you are welcome. Um, Katie, I think I've just answered that question. Helen's saying, when are you doing another live talk? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. Um, I don't know if we'll be doing this again. If we are, I don't know if I'll be invited back. If I am, um, what topic would I do? Not sure maybe talk about spirit photography or something like that um, which is a, another topic that I'm uh, very very interested in primarily because a lot of my a lot of my images are ghost images uh, that I've created but they're not real ghosts they are photographic representations of ghosts um, to my knowledge there are no authenticated spirit photographs so if you look up spirit photography for you know especially Victorian spirit photography uh, they're, they're pretty much all fakes and when I say they're all fakes as in they were fakes created at the time as opposed to fakes created now pretending to be from back then um, I'm only aware of one photographer who did spirit photography and wasn't proved to be a con man even though it's pretty darn certain he was and that was Mumler from um, I'm not sure where he was born but I believe he was certainly prosecuted in New York and before that I think he worked in I think it might have been Boston off the top of my head and um, so maybe I'd do a talk on that if, if people wanted but it would depend I mean let's be honest what's happening with all this COVID stuff don't know um, but yeah any other questions you are welcome Katie she's saying thank you um, any other questions that you'd like me to talk about because like I say I can talk about this all night 
I'm probably going to go downstairs when, and see my husband and, and tell him all the bits that I forgot to mention to you all that you might have found interesting. There we go. Right, I'll give it a new another few seconds, see if anything comes through, and if not, then I will just say thank you all very, very much for coming and sign off. I'm in the max can't sleep. Um, Helen's asking about spirit photography. Oh yes, educate us again. Um, if I don't know if Art de Mort will happen, it normally happens every six months. If it does, and if I'm invited back or something, I, I might talk about spirit photography um, if people are interested. Because it seems to fit in with the topic. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm hopeful I'm going to be able to work out how to download this and I will upload it up onto my YouTube channel. I'm going to do the sh shameless self-promotion bit here. My website is maraacoma.com. You can find links to me on social media from there, including my YouTube, etc. And also how to get in touch if you've got any questions down the line. Um, you know, something you think, oh, I should have asked her this. So thank you very much. Take care. And uh, thank you for coming. Bye bye.